Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Wadin webinar. I am Pekka Perälä, and I will act as the moderator in this webinar today. Today, we have an interesting presentation from our longtime partner, Flowing Goat, from Argentina. They are going to give us a sneak peek to AppChars, which is their new approach for implementing and sharing reusable modules that implement common functionalities found in business applications. And uh, we are very interested in hearing uh, feedback from the audience as well about this idea. And for that reason, we are going to ask your five calls during this webinar. And uh, so today's our guests are Martin Lovet, uh, Javier Godoy, and Bruno Acretti. Martin is the CEO uh, at Flowing Code. He's passionate about software development and also likes everything related to building business applications using Vardin. He has been using Java as his primary development platform since 2002 and served as development manager for over 12 years. Javier Godoy is working as a software architect at Flowing Code. He's also the practical applications teacher in interaction to programming and object oriented programming courses in Informatics Engineering Department at Universidad Nacional del Litoral. He also has a str strong experience in designing and implementing all kinds of applications, mostly in Java for more than 16 years. And we have Bruno, a software de developer working at Flowing Code. He's the main developer of AppChars and started his career by completing his internship at Flowing Code. Since then, he's working as a full-time employee while finishing his studies at Universidad Tecnológica Nacional. Warm welcome, Martin, Javier, and Bruno. We are super excited to have you today here. Thanks. So before we get started with the presentation, I have a couple of housekeeping things. So uh, I would ask everyone to keep lines muted during the webinar and uh, you can ask questions using the questions panel in the lower right hand of your screen. Uh, we will also have polls uh, that is next to the questions panel there and if we cannot answer your question immediately we'll come back to it in the end of the presentation and we will also send you a link to the slides and recording within the 24 hours. So here's the short recap of Vardin for those listeners who haven't used our products yet. Since year 2000, Vardin has been on a mission to help developers building web applications faster and providing that great user experience for the end users. Today, we have two frameworks, Vardin Flow and Hilla. Flow enables the Java developers to build web applications with pure Java, abstracting away web technologies and running the code on the server side. Hilla, on the other hand, is a TypeScript-based framework that allows integrating the reactive frontend to an existing Java backend. If you're interested and haven't tried it out yet, visit wadin.com and hilla.dev for more information about our technologies. But now, Back to the upchars. So, Martin, please take it away. Okay, thanks, Pekka. I will share. Okay, great. Well, uh, hello, everyone. Thanks for assisting to this webinar. We have a lot to see, so let's start right away. The main idea of this presentation is to tell you about this project that we've been working on called AppJars. These are basically pluggable modules for budding flow apps. What are pluggable modules, you might wonder. We'll find out about it during the presentation. But first, first of all, let's finish Pekka's introduction a little bit. Uh, a little bit about ourselves. We are a company from Argentina aiming primarily to export knowledge to the rest of the world. 
we are a team of professionals with some experience, like probably many of you, working with the Java platform and web frameworks for many years. We had to endure the process of deploying several applications to production, and providing uh, long evolutive maintenance for almost all of those applications. This gave us the opportunity to learn a lot about the whole process and also to think about the caveats that are not visible at first glance. Since Flowing Code's birth, we also have some experience in developing and maintaining a set of open source budding extensions that are available at our GitHub organization. So feel free to go in there if you want. Uh, during this period of time, we found ourselves uh, in the position of having to target some goals, like, for example, fulfill functional requirements, which is the most important goal of every application to be developed. We had to accomplish the implementation of some usual technical requirements. And after starting to maintain many, many of the developed applications, avoiding technical depth starting to be something more and more important. And also related to that, we started to avoid doing the same thing over and over again and try to reuse what was already designed and developed. Uh, luckily, we had some good things at hand, like, for example, of course, a platform, have as a whole, and that involves not only the language, but also the JVM uh, and all of the technology behind it. Of course, frameworks like Spring and Budding that takes care of a significant part of what is needed to be done. Good practices and standards that sometimes are written and explain it, but not always. So you start doing things in a particular way and then you replicate that in further projects. And software change management tools and also conventions related to how to build software in the correct way. But well, of course, you usually have to face a lot of challenges. First of all, if you choose some frameworks and libraries, they usually, depending on the version, of course, have a lot of issues when playing together. Uh, what is healthy is to focus on the functional requirements, but if things are flaky, you will probably start fighting with technical matters, and that should not happen because you start to move away from what the user really want. We are convinced that Badin is the best presentation framework ever, but the backend is a big land. There are too many ways of doing things. Then we don't want to reinvent the wheel. Uh, I want to reuse some code, but creating internal libraries and components that are shared between applications involve maintaining them, so you end up with a fight between those two aspects. The more you reuse, the more code that you have to maintain inside your organization that doesn't relate to the core of the business. Usually there is no time to implement what is needed in the best possible way. No time for the perfect user scrap, for the best process handling screens, for the best user profile page. We are usually overwhelmed with deadlines and we want to release something fast and quick that works. But sometimes we feel like we are being measured by the time to first use case. We also need senior developers at the beginning of the project because what was implemented at this point will be the base for the rest of the developments. If there is too much to do, the best thing is to have everything tidy at first. If not, then the quality of the further developments will decay. Regretfully, that was not always the case, so we needed something to, that would help starting the project fast with a stable architecture. So we always thought about a way of tackling all of these problems. We came up with something that will help, we think, many developers uh, that had to face the same challenges. We started to give shape to an idea, to rely on a really good set of application templates to avoid starting from zero, full stack enterprise application templates as the blank canvas 
that will allow adding full stack enterprise building blocks as the remaining pieces. The idea is to try to move from building an app to composing an app made up from smaller pieces. Each piece is what we call a module or an app share. And it's made up of three typical layers of a given enterprise application. We're going to, to get back to this later. Uh, well, while we were designing the application template, uh, Badin released the application template generator at star.badin.com. Many of you probably already know it. We think it's awesome. It's a really great starting point. So we decided to use it and to move forward with our idea. But well, there, there are some principles that we wanted to accomplish. The first one is plugability as first class citizen. We wanted to enhance the developer experience when adding the modules so you wouldn't need anything else, if possible, of course. We also wanted to have another principle. We call it fine-grained customization. We want these building blocks to be as easy to customize as possible. So you could change each part and make it work as you want. The API should be designed in such a way that it would allow the modules to be customized. Uh, also, we think that each module should work independently of the data store being used. And for that, we currently rely on Hibernate, but other optional implementations might happen in the future, like even uh, no SQL persistence. And finally, uh, these modules should be internally divided in such a way that they would work on different architecture styles, going from monolithics to REST API, basic apps, who know hexagonal architecture, domain driven development, etc. So, well, we told at the beginning that we have some experience on developing Badin add ons. Uh, we have several on our GitHub organization. We can consider that those add-ons are just related to the presentation part, like one layer of a cake. But in this case, each abjar module is like a complete portion of the cake, consisting in all three layers, the data access, the business logic, and the presentation layer. So well, this picture is like a clear representation of what we have in mind. So well, uh, at this point, we would like to know more of you. All right. Shortly, we'll see the uh, first polling question in the polls panel, uh, right hand lower corner. And the question is, do you ever need to implement any of these common capabilities in your business application? And this is multi-select, so select all that apply. All right, I see answers trickling in. So number one seems to be, okay, it's changed. Let's wait a few seconds. Okay, everything is, all of those are getting votes. So user profile management is number one with 56 votes at the moment, notifications, second dynamic menus, Asynchronous email sending, uh, activity logs. I, it seems that all of those are getting get, getting plenty of votes. Also, internationalization. Okay, great. That's interesting. All right. All right. Well, Maybe we'll move forward. I, I see that. There are no more votes trickling in. So go ahead, Martin. Thank okay. you for answering. Thanks. Well, let's let's continue. OK, uh, let's review what we saw up to this point from maybe a different perspective. I invite you to think that this circle represents the effort that you need in order to implement an enterprise application. By relying on frameworks, a lot of things are easier, of course, 
Then if you rely also on good practices, the effort is lower. If you don't start from scratch, you have another significant reduction on the amount of hours needed to complete the project. And if you finally can rely on these building blocks, you are closer to the target of having to focus only to the specific functional requirements of your application. So that is the goal that we want to, to achieve. We think that we could shift to a different paradigm when building applications, that the experience uh, should be like going to the supermarket and choosing the jars that we would like to use when building our app. So instead of building something from scratch, we would choose among hundreds of already built modules and create applications by composition. So you can focus on the unique features that deliver business value. This would derivate in releasing faster and alleviating the maintenance of applications by focusing on what is important to, to our business. So well, at this point, I would like to introduce Javier, who will continue from here. Uh, hi, Javier. OK. So let's take a closer look at how app shards <clears throat> uh, are composed internally. As Martin said earlier, we would like to have a strict separation of concerns so that app shards can be used with different kinds of architecture styles. And one of our main goals when designing each app shard is to avoid imposing constraints on the architecture of your application. Because you can have a monolithic application that is a single module with all the dependencies, persistence, presentation, services, but you can also can have a, each layer in a separate module. And in this case, the, mo the layers may be integrated in a single application or not. Maybe they are deployed separately and connect connected through REST APIs. There are many possibilities. So we are very careful to avoid introducing transitive dependencies that leaks from one layer to another. This image represents the typical breakdown of one app shard. There are different artifacts that you can add as dependencies depend, uh, according to the layer that you, are, you have in your application. First, we have contracts that are just set of interfaces that define methods that are exposed by that layer for persistence and business logic. Then we have the implementations. For instance, for persistence, we have implementations based on GPA, but we can also offer some other implementations based on non-relational databases, other object relational mapping solutions, maybe just plain JDBC. And the business logic does not depend on the exact implementation of persistence. And we also have a model, which is a set of data transfer object <clears throat> used for communicating between each layer. And one or more presentation modules. Currently, we are targeting the last version of Badin Flow, but in the future, we will have to mantain, maintain compatibility with different version of Badin, and we may also introduce other presentation frameworks such as support for Gila. So this structure allows us to support different combinations of persistent technologies and presentation technologies. And there is also a, a demo that demonstrates how to integrate this, the, all the, the components for the, the app shard and show how the app shard works. So to review what we saw earlier, the goal of AppShare is to build a set of reusable modules. And plugability is one of our main goals because we want the, that just by adding a dependency uh, with minimum configuration, you should be able to start using the AppShare. That requires that we provide some 
set of opinionated default, the same approach that does uh, that Spring Boot does and other frameworks. Uh, so if you are happy with that, you will need no configuration, but of course you will be able to customize the behavior. You may extend classes from the app share or even replace them with your own implementation if you need to do so. And it's very important that each Abshar is independent from the others. So you don't need to include unrelated dependencies or unwanted modules just because you need one feature. You, you add what you need. But at the same time, Abshars are able to work together. We will see an example of this uh, later. So if you have several Abshars in your application, some of them can contribute some services that can be used by other upshards. And well, I think that's enough of theory. So let's see this in action. We'll... Okay, then I will share my screen and I will show you a quick demo. There I'm. Share, sorry, my screen, my screen. Well, okay. The goal of the, of this demo will be basically to show you how uh, AppShares modules are basically imported and how they interact with each other. And and well, the first thing we want to do for this demo is come here to startupbudding.com and we want to down, download a a starter budding project. Uh, but in this case, I will actually add uh, one more view. Um, so that I can use, uh, so that entities are configured in the application. And I will also configure the access so that security is also configured in the application. All right, and also in the settings tab, uh, we won't be needing a Git repository. So, well, I will download the application. And the next uh, thing we want to do after the application is downloaded is basically, okay, it hasn't downloaded for, for some reason. Wait a second. So, uh, valid servers are a bit uh, slow right now, it seems like. Um, OK, let me refresh uh, the screen, because for some reason, it didn't download the, the project. OK, it's still configured the same way. Yes, that's right. I will try it again. Sorry for this interruption. There it is. <laughs> Thank you. OK, and we can uh, and now un unzip this uh, project. And the next thing we want to do is just uh, import it in the ID of choice. In this case, it will be Eclipse. Uh, let me just import this project. OK, and while I'm importing the project, uh, I will tell you the next thing we want to do, which is add the dependencies to the POM. Um, uh, the projects, sorry, the app source modules that I will be uh, putting in first glance is a process manager, first of all, which is a module that lets you uh, manage uh, and schedule processes within your application. And uh, also, I am going to be adding IETNet Manager, which is a uh, which is a, a module that lets you manage the internationalization of of your application, and also manage uh, translations and some uh, stuff uh, like that. Okay, we come here to the end of the the dependencies tag and add the dependencies. And also, uh, one little uh, thing is that we want to whitelist the Flowing Go package. Go because uh, the application is actually using um, some uh, add-ons, and that's why we have to add it to the whitelist um, list. But okay, I am updating the the Maven project, and then we'll be running the application. Uh, and you may have seen that uh, these are uh, three separate imports. That's because of uh, the thing that Javier said earlier, which is that. Um, uh, which is that uh, you could uh, import each layer separately in, in depending on your use case and your architecture so that it doesn't become an architectural constraint. 
So let's wait for the application to build. Uh, meanwhile, um, we will go more in depth with each one of these modules uh, later in the presentation. So, so bear with us here. <laughs> okay, let's wait for the project to build. Uh, after it is done uh, building, we will be, we will access IT Manager. I will show you in a bit. There it is, starting the front end compilation, and there it is. Okay, here we are in the login page. I will enter as, as admin, and as you may see here, there isn't much uh, difference besides the application we've just uh, created and downloaded with uh, startupvalium.com. But if we, for example, uh, put some random URL, we will be able to see that uh, there are new URLs that have popped up in, in our application. These are actually uh, routes that the each uh, AppJust module has uh, configured by itself. These uh, URLs are, are actually configurable. If you wanted to change the, the, URL, the URL of each view, you could. But well, it's not the idea for now. Here we have uh, one of the views. Uh, by the way, each, um, sorry, the AppJust modules have its own um, layout and also in this uh, menu, each uh, AppShares uh, uh, view is added as a menu item automatically, so no need to think about that. And we'll see what we can do with IT Net Manager. For example, uh, we have the default English, English language. Uh, we have our translation here. It is empty because we're currently using uh, fallback translations. But uh, for example, let's say that in some other part of, of our application, for example, here in the process menu, um, we want to change some, some kind of translation or, or string. For example, this button that says new process, I don't know. I don't really like a new process. I like, for example, create process a little bit better. So we come here to the language we're currently using and add uh, an item key. The item key is the key of the, that translation in particular. And we can edit the translation, for example, uh, create a process it was, right? Process. And there it is saved. And if we come to the other view, we can see that it uh, changed the translation. Um, you can do this in your whole application uh, and, and in the, the other AppShares modules as well. Uh, okay, um, now we will try to create a process, but we cannot create a process yet because the project doesn't have any kind of, of component that can be run, right, or, or scheduled so that it can be fired. So what we will do then is uh, I'll stop this and I will add two more dependencies so that I can show you two more modules. Wait one second. I will be adding uh, email manager, which lets you handle email sending and creation and well, sending asynchronously through an SMTP server, and also dynamic menu that uh, lets you um, build your the menu of your application uh, using the available routes that, uh, that you have, right? Okay, let's wait for it to build. There we go, we'll run it now. And well, uh, now that we actually um, imported email manager, um, this module will provide a task uh, for process manager, and we will be able to to uh, schedule a process. You will see in a in a bit. Let's uh, wait a second. Uh, there it is. It is already done. Okay, and I will access again to the language screen, for example. As you see here, uh, the menu items have uh, changed. Uh, we only have one menu item, which leads us to this dynamic menu manager. And here we can uh, administrate our menu items and create our own menu. Let's try creating some. For example, the uh, items, we will be creating the this uh, menu item so we can access this view. And uh, here are all the URLs available in our application. It is this one and I guess some kind of icon. I will put this one, for example. OK, and I am go also going to create the one for process uh, manager or processes. It is written that way. Yes, I think so. <laughs> OK, PM dash processes and some kind of, I don't know, range maybe or a calendar because 
uh, you can schedule the processes. Uh, and I will also create one for email manager for the emails, right? For that view. EM dash list. And I will put some kind of envelope maybe. Um, and an interesting feature of dynamic menu is that actually you can uh, set up the permissions for each um, for each one of the menu items. You can uh, put which roles the user uh, needs to have in order to for the menu to show that item in particular for the logged in user. So that's nice. And uh, also there's some uh, there's a hierarchical um, feature uh, for the menu items. For example, we could have uh, utilities here uh, menu item and we could put these ones in utilities and if we refresh the menu you will be able to see that here we have the the utilities tab with with the other uh, views that we can access as well uh, okay now what we have uh, email manager um, I will actually create a new process as you can see there it is the mail sender uh, service which um, which is provided by email manager and lets you send the emails asynchronically. Uh, uh, maybe this name is all right. It's email sender tasks, for example, and we can schedule it. For example, you can use current expressions or maybe the, um, a default set of uh, of um, timings or schedules, right? And OK, this will check every 15 seconds if there are emails that are pending to be sent and they are in a queue and, and then send them. OK, so I will save this process here and now I will create an email. For example, I don't know, test at uh, .com, for example, uh, test at flowingcode.com and I don't know, anything, right? And I will create this email. Uh, now the thing that I want to do is actually add this email to the sending queue. And now it's send pending, as you can see. And now if we come to the processes, we can now resume the process. And every 15 seconds, the, uh, the process will actually fire. You can see it here, uh, every 15 seconds. Let's wait for the process, there it is. Uh, the process fired. There, there are one email uh, awaiting to be sent, and then it is sending the email. And if we come back to emails, oh, sorry, uh, to emails here, it is already sent. And uh, I am hosting a fake SNTP server. So actually, if we come to the fake SNTP server, uh, we can see that the email was correctly sent. So we saw uh, what we can do with uh, the AppCharts modules and how easy it is to to import it, and uh, which is important is that we used uh, zero lines of code. We only added the imports. So that is very interesting. And well, that's uh, all for the demo. Uh, now let's get with some with some polls. All right, thank you, Bruno, for interesting presentation. I saw that we have uh, one question. So maybe, I don't know if Martin would like to take that one before we go to the poll. So. Uh, the question is that will AppChars be available for free usage to the voting community or only for pro subscribers to be paid? Uh, <clears throat> hello. Well, that's, that's a great question. We are currently thinking about the best way of providing this to, to the whole community. We want to find the perfect balance. So it will help the project to continue, of course, because it doesn't seem, but it's a big effort. And of course, we want to help the entire community of developers because we empathize, because we've been there. We did this a lot of times, and we, will, we want it to stop, basically. So well, sorry for not being so specific, but I uh, think that we are currently working a lot in finding a good balance. All right. Thank you, Martin. And now to the polling question number two, it's already available and many of you found it. So uh, question is how useful would it be to have pre-built lockable modules, app chars out of the box for what in flow apps? And uh, we have 51 votes so far. And most of you find it very useful or somewhat useful. So uh, I see that many of you see the value of having something out of the box rather than implement yourself. 
All right. Uh, let's move forward with the presentation. Thank you for answering the poll. Well, in the demo, we saw how to integrate app shards in a fresh application just created from a starter. But what if I want to integrate app shards to an existing application? Well, if you are using Spring Boot, probably a lot of things will be done automatically. But to be specific, you will need to configure the application to scan the services and repositories so that they can be instantiated by Spring and then configure the application to use the provided persistent entities and take into account that some tables will be created on your database, depending on what each app shard needs to persist. And also configure badding to scan the roads for, from the provided views. Then from your code, you can call services from app shards, and you can also navigate from your views to AppShards views. And now let's talk in more detail about some of the AppShards. One of them that we already saw in the demo is Internationalization Manager. This AppShard manages internationalization dynamically in the database. Usually, internationalization is implemented with static resource files or bundles which require a new deployment every time you need to modify a translation. That is the, the simplest implementation. But the static approach is only fine for small applications. In more complex cases, there may be many translations or many supported languages or both. And perhaps it's not the developers who set the translation, but this task is delegated to professional translators or people with extensive knowledge of the application domain, but who are not developers. Or maybe even if few languages are supported, there is a strict deployment process, but at the same time, you also want flexibility for fixing a wrong translation or renaming a, a button or a menu item without going through the full deployment cycle again. So having uh, the translation managed dynamically in the database allows to modify that on runtime. This AppShare integrates with Badding Internationalization support, and it allows bulk upload of translation values, and it also provides a CRUD view for easily editing the different labels, where you can compare the translation in different languages and modify them. Currently, we're also working on adding support for automatic translation from a main language, a reference language, to other languages, so that you don't need to start from scratch when setting the translations. Another app share that we also see so in the demo is Process Manager. Its purpose is controlling the execution of scheduled processes. Yes, I know that you're going to tell me that Spring already supports that and Quartz already supports the scheduled processes. But again, we have the same problem as before. Suppose that we have a process that is scheduled to run every day at 3 a.m. and we want to change it to run at a different time or we want to disable it. The process schedule is usually given in the source code or in a property file. So if we want to modify it, we may need to redeploy the application or at least modify a property file and then restart the server or do something in order to reload those properties. This uh, app shard allows modifying the process schedule, schedule on runtime, and it also allows scheduling the immediate execution of a process, which is also useful uh, not only if you need to run the process before it's scheduled time, but also during development or testing because you need to run the process one and again in order to test it. So, well, all of this is uh, possible with Process Manager. and. The processes are just runnable instance of the runnable interface. So it's very easy to implement your own tasks and use them with process manager. And other apps shards also contribute runnable process, such as the, the email manager. Uh, regarding this app shard, we are currently working on implementing access control lists for restricting who can execute or configure the processes and also temporarily disabling the execution of a process. Another app shard 
is activity log. In this case, the purpose is logging different activities in the system. It takes the output mostly from logging libraries, and it will support different views that allow filtering some tags of interest. This is not intended as a replacement for a complete log visibility solution, such as an AL key stack, Elasticsearch log slash Kibana. But in some cases, you just need to track some specific items of user activity or the output of some background process and have that information accessible from the application. So that will be the, the scope of this app share. Other app share is configuration manager. Uh, its purpose is allowing runtime configuration of both global settings and user scoped settings and tracking who modifies each setting and what changes they did. These app shards integrate with a Spring value annotation so that you can easily inject the configured values into Spring Beans. And we already implemented support for several common data types, number, string, days. And we're currently working on adding support for custom data time, such as entities from your model and multi-valued properties, as well as providing support for constraints, validations uh, for each uh, property, such as regular expression or accepted value ranges. We also have dynamic menu, which allows you to dynamically manage a side menu and persist that menu in the database. So you can configure the access control list for each menu item. The accesses are based on the concept of granted authorities from security, and you can create or remove entries also on runtime. It supports hierarchical menus and automatically detects which button roads are configured and make them available for creating the new menus uh, from the application. Uh, and we are uh, we, in the in our roadmap. We have we are considering adding support for different layouts, not only a side menu, but it can also be a a tablet uh, menu or something like, like that. Other app share is the email manager. In this case, it is it provides a background task for sending emails. So that not only that you don't need to block until the email is sent, but you also avoid failing the, the user action. For instance, if the email server is down, uh, it will just store the message and we retry it later. So it provides a better user experience. And this app share manages the persistence of the messages, messages that are scheduled to be sent so that you can guarantee that the email will actually be sent at some time after the database transaction is committed, and also that pending messages survive server restarts. The implementation is based on the Shabax email API, and it provides a runnable task that is used by the process manager. It supports attaching files and also tracking the history of some messages as we saw. And it has an optional view that you can enable if you want to see that information from the application. We, you, we used it in the demo. We plan supporting temp templates and edition features for email templates. We also have security manager, which manages uh, basic security elements of an application, such as groups, authorities, users, Remember that app shards are solutions involving the three layers of an application. So the security manager takes care of persisting the user credentials and which accesses or roles are assigned to each user. And it also provides a user interface for creating new user and modifying their permissions. And the implementation uh, follows the recommended schema for Spring security. So th there are a lot of scripts for different databases that, that you can run. And last but not least, we have user profile, which provides uh, a, a feature for 
editing user information, such as full name, email addresses, and even uploading an avatar image that you can display in the application. And also uh, provides an administration view that allows each user to edit its own information. In, in the roadmap, we have uh, adding configurable field for additional properties to the user profile. And there are also other upshots that we have planned. One of them is adding support for entity attribute value models that is useful for models with heterogeneous or sparse entities. So we can provide some persistent implementation of entity attribute value and some views based on this model. We are also considering a workflow manager which can provide the backbone for many different systems because there are many use cases that can be modeled as operation on a workflow. And other abstracts that we have in our roadmap are data query and dynamic CRUD because enterprise applications have many requirements that are related to CRUD operations and then obtaining some kind of report from the entities that were modified through the CRUD. And in the, the ecosystem, Badin does a very good job with Binder and Grid at the presentation layer. And if you are using, for instance, a relational database, GPA does a very good job for persistence. So that there are many parts already there. And we think that we can provide some wiring in order to to obtain a comprehensive solution that integrates all the three layers. So, well, now we have some, some questions. All right, thank you, Javier. So uh, we should be seeing the third poll shortly. Uh, the question is, uh, what benefits might your organization get from using app charts? And this is multi-select, so select all that apply. All right, seeing some votes. Let's wait for a bit, 40 votes. All right, so uh, we're seeing that saving development time together with avoid re reinventing the wheel and uh, reducing code base to be maintained seems to be neck to neck top three right now but also saving the development costs and uh, focus on the business value or the uni unique features for their business rather than basic modules. All right, very interesting. Okay, and now more votes to re avoid reinventing the wheel. So many benefits there and uh, all right we have additional next question coming up so um, next one is what would be the technical considerations for using app charts and again you can use uh, you can select all that apply All right, I see votes coming in. Let's wait for a bit. Compatibility with architecture and tech stack seems to be high as well as customizability. As well as how it works with Wadin and uh, how it easy it is to migrate to new versions of app charts. So uh, basically how smooth migration path we are seeing. All right, compatibility and customizability seem to be the top three here. All right, thank you. Uh, that was the poll number three. One, one more coming a little bit later, but I'll keep floor back to, I think, Martin right now. 
No, in fact, Javier will continue. Yeah. Well, um, we have learned that the universe of enterprise application is so big and that the requirements are not always exactly the same. So we anticipate that not every application will benefit from every single app chart. And to be honest, app chart is not a silver bullet because as we all know, there is no silver bullet. What app chart is, it is a collection of building blocks. And the main idea behind this pro project is just that, providing a wide collection of this block so that you can pick what you need. And who will gain benefit by using AppShark? First, it will be useful for freelancers because they will be able to create applications faster and with more features. If a customer requests an application, what if you can quickly create the basics and then focus on what the customer needs instead of building some kind of general purpose module? Mostly freelancers maybe don't have the bandwidth in order to take this endeavor. But it would also be useful for software factories. They have developers who can implement this kind of modules, but it is worth the effort. Maintaining reusable modules is not just about writing them. You also need to maintain them, evolve them, fix issues, implement new features, and at the same time, maintain compatibility with older versions. It is a lot of effort and software factories need to deliver application to the customer, deliver them fast. They need to focus on teamwork. And maybe it is distracting to allocate developer time in order to, to, to build some kind of module. So they can use AppShards in order to delegate that, that part of the implementation. And it will also be useful for big companies that may have several vendors providing them applications because who amongst all of those uh, software providers will maintain a set of reusable components and if none of them does so why paying for the same theater once and again from each different provider and finally it might also be a good cho choice for prototyping because it will give you a lot of features already there on top of which you can start trying new concepts and maybe you can think of more scenarios where some solution like this might be useful. All right, uh, let's back get to final polling question. So I think it should be published right now. You should be seeing it. So uh, overall, what's your feedback on app charts? All right, let's see people voting, 20 votes, 40. All right, I see many people are very intrigued, but they need to le learn more about app charts and uh, they want to try it out and uh, one fifth is can definitely see the value already at this point. All right, thank you. A few more votes trickling in, but uh, I think we'll move on to the questions part. All right. Okay. So let's check. We have a bunch of questions coming up from here. So I'll try to take them, them in a chronological order. So uh, first from Manfred, which versions of Spring Boot and Wani are supported right now? OK, that's, <clears throat> that's a great question. Um, as you were able to see, we are, we are, we are using the latest versions uh, that are provided by an application created at start.badding.com. Maybe Bruno can provide the exact version, but for example, today there was a new release and it's working fine with the latest Badding version at least, and the uh, Spring Boot recommended version by, by Badding. That's what we are currently supporting. But given that those frameworks are 
uh, really good at the compatibility level. Of course, uh, it's highly probable that it will be compatible in the future and a little bit behind, but not, of course, Vadin 14. But uh, starting for Vadin 23, uh, you should be able to use them. All right, thank you. Uh, next one from Gordon. Uh, are there APIs guidelines to develop our own app charts models? That's a really interesting question. Um, yes, you should be able to develop your own app charts. There are no guidelines right now, but we could think about creating something like that in the future. It's not rocket science. Uh, what we are doing is trying to not to do something obscure and something that you won't understand, but it will just work. We want to make something friendly for your applications. So like we said, we are dividing the application strictly in different layers. So we can support different flavors of architecture styles. Uh, so right now you should be able to create your own if you want, but well, that's, that's not the idea. The idea is that you can uh, avoid wasted time on that and focusing on your business, but well, it's, it's like that. Of course, we are, the idea will be to invest a significant amount of time of having good documentation and good guidelines, of course, to use them and to extend them. All right. Thank you. Uh, then David is asking, are the one in representations uh, UI views styleable? How do you style them? Well, good question. We are not doing anything strange. Uh, if you follow the training at badin.com for styling your application, it will be exactly the same uh, for styling our applications. You can inspect the DOM and you can uh, change whatever you want. And uh, given that, like I said earlier, we are not creating something obscure, you should be able to extend the view and change whatever you want. Suppose you want to add a specific class name to a specific button. Uh, we are not going to close that. You can do that if you want. You can even change completely the view if that is what you want, still reusing uh, the services and the data access layer or the other way around. You might prefer to change the data layer, but still uh, use the business logic and the presentation part. All of the layers are uh, replaceable, uh, so you can play around if you have specific needs that you would like to accomplish. All right, um, then we have uh, from Dario, next one. Um, uh, super for other tech stacks, especially that's, Quarkus. Yeah, that's I, I seen that, and I was thinking that. Yeah, our idea was to be completely independent of the dependency injection framework or the supporting framework, let's say, and we try to follow that uh, in a very strict way. In fact, the only thing that is tidying us to Spring Boot at this point are annotations, and you can easily disregard that if you are using something else and of course extending. And given that each layer, uh, well, what idea is to provide optional dependencies. Uh, think about, for example, uh, suppose that in the future we are going to support no SQL databases. That you, choosing the correct dependency, it doesn't matter if you're using Maven or Gradle uh, and you can use a different implementation. That's the path we are going to follow, of course, depending on the user's need. Uh, if the user start to demand Quarkle support, we are probably going to go into that direction. But I'm completely uh, sure that we are going to reuse a lot of things. It's not that you need to change so much in order to support another thing, for example, CDI or something like that. Yeah, I would just want to, to add that the contracts are agnostic of almost everything. So even if at, at this time we are not implementing support for a, any specific tech stack, uh, it is considered to that we can add additional tech stacks in parallel with the existing ones. All right, thanks for the clarification. Uh, then we have from uh, Patrick. Uh, okay, this was 
maybe partially un answered already. Do abstracts rely on some kind of common framework or library? It's still a, a good question. We try to make it as pure as possible, but if we had to use something, we try to use something that is heavily used uh, for the entire community. Uh, our main basis at this point in the presentation view uh, is Vadin, of course, because we like Vadin. <laughs> and in the service layer is the most pure of all of the layers because in there you only have business logic. Of course, we have a strict contract that the service layer is implementing. We're trying to follow clean architecture guidelines for, for that. And regarding the, the persistent layer, like we said earlier, we are using JPA. Uh, but given that JPA is just an implementation, uh, we should be able to change it. And then I think we are using uh, something minimal that is not intrusive, maybe Lombok, but that's it. Uh, we are also using uh, a library for uh, tidying things in the backend. That is an open source uh, library that is available at uh, one of our GitHub organizations. But that is some, something minimal to help organize uh, the, the contracts. We want to, to them to be uh, configurable and flexible, but that's it, not, not much. All right, thank you so much for the answers. I think that was the last of the questions today. So uh, thank you so much for presenting Martin, Javier and Runa. Very interesting. Looks like our audience was very interested in the idea as well. And uh, I just want to remind everybody that we will send, the, we will be sending the slides, uh, slides and the recording in 24 hours for all the participants. So thank you so much for the watching and have a good evening and good day for everyone. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Thank you. I hope you all enjoyed it. Thanks. Thank you.